It's my pleasure to introduce to you Lucas Nickel. Uh, Luke is from Abbotsford, BC, and he grew up on a large poultry farm with 75,000 broilers, 40,000 layers, and 20,000 turkeys. He's currently in his second year studying animal health at the University of Alberta and has a dream of becoming a veterinarian. So, Lucas, would you please come up and, and talk to us? I'm the son of Ray Nickel, who is the BC Poultry Association president, and yeah, attending the U of A in my second year of the animal health program. I come from a fairly large poultry operation in Abbotsford, and one of the main reasons that I have been asked to speak today is because in April of 2004, our farm was infected with the avian flu. So today, in the next few minutes, I'm going to be highlighting the BC poultry industry in 2004, the panic of the avian influenza, and some of the aftermath. I'm going to be trying to focus more on the social aspect of what was all going on, but I do, uh, I do understand that some financial figures will help you to understand a little bit better. So to begin, I'm just going to be going over uh, some background of the poultry industry in BC slash the Fraser Valley in 2004. So our farm is located in Abbotsford, which is about an hour east of Vancouver. It is also central to the Fraser Valley, which spans from Hope to the outskirts of Vancouver. Uh, the Fraser Valley has been a huge hub for farming because of the ag agriculture land reserves. The ALR was uh, instituted in the 1970s and holds provincial zones which have uh, primary farming uses and non-agriculture uses are controlled. So this has led to lots of poultry being farmed in the Fraser Valley. To give you a little more of an idea, in 2004 in BC, there are 579 poultry producers, 147 million kilograms of chicken, 15 million kilogra kilograms of turkey, 59 million dozen of eggs, and 113 million broiler hatching eggs produced annually. And you can understand that 80% of all of these products were produced inside the Fraser Valley. The BC poultry industry was creating 400 million farm gate cash receipts and a billion total in revenue. So when the avian flu hit on February 19th, 2004, you can understand this was, this was a very big deal. And interesting enough, if you would have polled farmers at this time about what the avian flu was or what were the implications, I would have bet most of them would have had no idea what it was or thought that it was some isolated disease that was happening in Asia and nothing that we needed to be concerned about. So now came the panic. So it's hard for you to understand the panic without being there, so hopefully I'm able to describe it in a proper way. So you can understand this was a billion dollar industry that was hit by a devastating disease. At first, it seemed to be isolated at one farm, and it was low path. They decided to quarantine that farm and see if I began to get involved. They initially thought they could hold it to that area and began setting up a five kilometer surveillance radius. Three weeks later, a new farm came up in the five kilometer radius and the AI had mutated into a high path. The virus then started jumping out of the five kilometer zone and started spreading. This is when people started to get worried and industry representatives started getting involved. Working alongside PEP, which is the Provincial Emergency Program, and CFIA. As you can understand, this turned into a mess pretty quickly. You have a lot of differences of opinions and people have uh, not been able to do anything like this before. There's also the stress of not being able to move any birds and lots of the farmers weren't aware of what they could do and the limitations. So one of the famous quotes at that time came from Marvin Friesen. I have some good news. You can c continue to place chicks, but I have some bad news. They must be fully cooked. So you can understand what was going on all during that time. They started to have industry rallies. These were done to try and get people in industry aware and understand what was going on and the implications. My dad was uh, elected to be one of those representatives and he was put in media relations. At the time, he was a feed salesman for a local feed company of Clipper Grain and Milling. He got his time cut in half because, as you can imagine, there wasn't a lot of feed to sell because there wasn't a lot of chickens. So he had to try and have the tough job of relaying correctly and positively back to the general public what was all going on. Because we needed people to keep eating chicken or else there would be further implications in the future. 
As you can imagine, this was a tough and stressful job when you knew things on the outside were chaotic, but you had to try and give a calm, positive persona to the public. Other representatives, like George Gray, were put in logistics. He had the, the job of contacting producers and telling them that they needed to kill their perfectly healthy birds. As you can imagine, the reason for doing this was they needed to stop, start depopulating the negative birds that were around the positive farms to stop the virus from spreading. This is a tough job to tell producers that they need to kill their healthy birds and not understand where compensation is going to come at that time. You weren't sure if you were going to get full money back or not. And it was kind of spreading like a forest fire. So if you know anything about forest fires, you need to take away the good wood that's that is around uh, the burning wood. And then you have all these dead birds. What are you going to do with 15 million dead birds? So there's lots of ideas that were put out there. At first, they were talking about getting 250 dump trucks and taking the birds to who knows where. There's also talk that they were getting uh, reefer trucks and they're going to haul the birds up to Princeton, which is around three hours away, and they're going to put them in an air curtain incinerator. But the trucks, the refrigerated units on the truck started to fail and they started leaking into a parking lot. So you can understand this is a time where nobody's dealt with this kind of stuff before, and it's going to lead to mistakes. But in the end, all the birds were brought to a local farm site where they were comp composted in large agriculture bags. In the end, about 15 million birds were voluntarily depopulated. The positive birds infected, which was around 2.4 million, were kept mostly on farm and put through an intensive composting regimen. So this was... Because our farm tested positive, this is what we had to do. So I remember having manure sit outside of our barns for about two years until it reached the proper internal temperature. So you can imagine the smell and the flies that we had. And at that time, our house was about, uh, about 10 feet from our barns, which is not ideal to begin with, but that's the way it was. And I remember just, I don't think we ate outside for two years because of all the flies. And I'm not going to go so far as my friends didn't come over because of the smell, but... Let's just say my place wasn't ideal. And after you were done with the manure, you had to deal with some of the cleaning and disinfecting. So as you can imagine, it was very tough in old facilities, and at that time we had about a 30-year-old lay barn. So trying to get that up to the cleaning standards was pretty, pretty difficult. You had different um, inspectors who would come. I think my next slide shows some of the before and after pictures of how clean you needed to get it. So we'd have inspectors that would come in, but these inspectors would also rotate throughout the weeks. So you'd have the one inspector would come in and say, you need to clean all the roof panels and you got to get that, all that crap out. And then the next guy would come through and he'd say, oh, you didn't need to do that. And you're pulling out your hair because you've been sending guys up there for the last two days to try and clean this stuff. And also you had men you had 30 blue smurf looking guys working around the clock trying to get your barns clean because you had pressure from everyone else because nobody could place birds till every positive farm was cleaned and disinfected up to the standard. So it was, you had to do it in a really quick time and at that point you didn't know where the money was coming from to do this. It eventually did get funded by the industry and everyone was fully compensated but at the time you weren't sure exactly what was going to go on. So as you can understand, during this whole time, it was a very stressful time for all farming families, employees, and people working in the industry. If you knew my dad before 2004, you knew he didn't have a lot of hair. And you sure knew after 2004, he had even less. I remember him coming home one time and talking to my mom and just wondering if this thing was ever going to end. It seemed every time you would isolate it, it would pop back up in another place. There was even crisis lines that were set up so anyone could call in and uh, have someone to talk to. This does seem kind of silly now, but at the time you had lots of people in leadership positions who were having stress meltdowns and just couldn't deal with all of it. Um, for example, my mom had to go back full time to work. She had the responsibilities of raising me and my two siblings, and my dad was hardly home during that time. This was a key factor in my mom having a nervous breakdown. Lots of people lost their jobs to feed Companies went out of business, and there was also impacts at the local municipality. There wasn't, obviously there's going to be a lot less sales in um, equipment sales, 
and truck leases, etc. The mayor was also involved in, and concerned, and this is a lot of reason why the industry rallies were held. But with all this going on, it was an important time, and key people did stand up. People like my dad, George Gray, Marvin Friesen, etc. There's also the firefighters got involved with having to take out all the dead birds and get involved with the cleaning procedure, and they were a big help. There's also help from the local marketing boards, the Ministry of Agriculture, including our provincial minister at that time, John Van Doggen, were all big helps. So in the end, it all finally came to an end, April 27, 2004. There was a total of 42 infected farms and losses of over 100 million. It was time for the rebuilding process to begin. Although altogether it was a very grim time, it had many positive things that were the outcome. For example, biosecurity. Back in 2004, we had a pretty naive perspective on what biosecurity all meant. We'd have farm tours. I remember to have my friends into the, into the barns all the time. If you changed your boots, that was a good day, but sometimes you didn't. And now, the changes that we've seen is, if I was ever caught having my friends in the barn, I think dad would kill me. And you change your boots between farms and changing of coveralls and boot dips and gates, et cetera. So I believe that was a big positive thing that happened through all of uh, the turmoil in 2004. So in summary, avian influenza in 2004 was a stressful time for all involved, but looking forward, I believe the future looks bright. So I just wanna give a thank you to Ray Nickel and George Gray for giving me a snapshot of what was all going on during that time. Germs on the run, and the saleswoman and servicemen are targeting each one. Sending germs on the run, germs 